All right, we're going to start. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to After Hours. Uh, joining me today in this lovely venue that's worked out so perfect is AJ. Welcome, AJ. She's a multi-talented artist. First met you through Glasswork, mm -hmm. and we've talked more. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I think when we're all young, we all have, we all want to draw and color and potentially have the artist in us, I think, if we're encouraged. When did it take hold in you? Very, very, very young. Very young. I just remember cycling through as a kid going, oh, you know, maybe I could be an actor or a comedian or, you know, do this, that, and the other thing. And I always came back to art. Art always felt right. So was it what? Something in, like we all do the doodles and coloring book and that kind of thing. Was there anything in your family that sort of... My dad is a photographer and a videographer, but I was just so more interested in um, painting to begin with and illustration. And then I got into photography and then I got into glass. And it's just all of my mediums just kept snowballing outwards. And it just, I couldn't focus on any one thing. It had to be all. All or nothing. All or nothing. So you have formal training. I do, yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about that? How were you encouraged during that training? I, I have to tell this story because it, I'll remember it forever. Uh, I was taking a high school in art class. Um, and the instructor, we were doing, I don't even know what I was doing, but anyway, there were clay projects and he was walking around talking to people. And one person, a fellow, I think, I don't even remember what he looks like, he picked up his clay sculpture and he squished it. And I was appalled. I mean, mm. I was young, I didn't even know, but I, that was the last time I went to his class. Mm. So talk a bit about the kind of experience you had in your training. It was just about everything. Like I, I started, of course, doing art all through, you know, elementary and high school. But then I ended up at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario to do fine arts. How did you choose that? Like what was the process to go from doing it sort of for yourself to, oh, I'm actually going to school for this? I couldn't see any other direction. I just... Art was so much a core part of my being, core part of the way I saw the world, the core part of how I regulated with my environment, that art just ended up being the only choice at the end of the day. Because anything else would have just not felt uh, the same in sense of authenticity, in sense of passion, in sense of the place where I would really feel the most fulfilled in life. Complete. Yes. So you went to two places, right? Yes. What was the difference and what did each one, what was the differences there and what did each one give you, do you think? Fanshawe, it was more a foundational level where we experimented with all different mediums, which I really enjoyed because we were doing sculpture, photography, painting, illustration, drawing, uh, life drawing, just everything across the board. And it gave me a good foundation in just understanding how I can manipulate different mediums and what really drew me in. And then I took a gap year and then I moved on to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design over in Halifax. And there I focused more on digital manipulation, studio practice with photography. Uh, did a more technical? Oh. Well, not technical, it's all technical, sorry. Well, it was just, it was another medium again, um, but it was also a lot of studio practice um, and the camaraderie of working with my cohorts, both in both institutions. But I found NASCAD, which was much more um, focused in the sense that this was an art-based university. Fanshawe is a community college, they do everything, they train everyone. Okay. Um, but NASCAD, everybody in there is creative, and it really just ignites your soul when you're surrounded by that many creative people. 
That's interesting. So how did your group of people work together? All talented. I would think sometimes there might be judgment or competition. Was there any of that or it was just such an open? Um, it depends because some people were much more insular with their practice. They were much more isolating in themselves in guarding their concepts, guarding their ideas. Oh, yes. And others were much more able to really put themselves out there, engage in critique. And that, those were the people that I really benefited the most from in a very constructive way. constructive way, a symbiotic way, because we all realized that critique is about the work. It's not about the person. And if you're able to remove yourself from the work and just focus on the work, you have the highest opportunity to really improve and grow. Well, that's very interesting because I, I in adult life, took some art classes and painting classes. I went, took a couple classes at Emily Carr. They were just for fun, just for me, whatever. Mm -hmm. I felt this real, and I took a private class with a woman that I had met originally at Emily Carr. And I found it, um, I judged myself. Mm. It was like, everybody's so talented. I have no talent. Mm. I guess the question is, or I want you to talk about, maybe it was so in you that the talent question wasn't a question. I'm always questioning my talent. I'm always questioning my ability. Every single time. Like I, I look at some of my old work, some of my works in progress, and I'll be able to go, okay, this I know could stand to improve. I know enough now where if I went back, I would approach this differently. And I try to do it in as compassionate of a way as I can, because that way I'm not going into the realm of judgment of I am less. It's here are the places I can learn. How can I really embody that? Interesting. Now you're working uh, in glasswork. Yeah. How has that maybe changed your perspective? Has it, what has that taught you? Has it taught you something? Has it added to what you've known? The biggest thing that I have learned working with Bill Jameson, my mentor at the glass shop, is the lesson of impermanence. When we first started working together, we were getting ready to do shows. And we get to the one show and we're unloading the van and we get to the last piece. It's this giant like five by eight foot piece. And it's got a giant crack down the middle. And I look at it and I just kind of choke. I'm like, oh, because I, I had never encountered this kind of issue before. I've never had a piece arrive to a show. Torn in the middle. Torn in the middle. Like, it's not like we can get in there with some super glue and put it back together. It's going off to the dumpster. And that's where exactly where we went. We picked it up, we hauled it over, and smashed it in. And Bill just shrugged his shoulders and said, all right, let's get going. Let's continue. Oh, my God. And I'm still emotionally. Pain. Well, I'm emotionally recovering. It's not a piece that I was personally connected to, but I knew it was of significance because it was coming to us to show. And it really taught me that shit happens. It's always going to happen. What you do after the fact, that's where it really matters. And that has really informed not only my studio practice, but my life practice as well, of to be able to not hold on to it, acknowledge it, absolutely, but be able to get past it to work to a constructive solution. With Learn that lesson. from it. Learn from it. Do something about it. But if you're just going to stay stuck in that part of, oh, shit, it's, it's done, it's broken, well, it's not helping anything. So where did, you've got a series of whales. Yeah. We'll start there. I keep looking at the forest. The forest draws <laughs> me. Where did that, why whales? Where did this come from? Um, I was just really drawn towards 
all of these different cetaceans and there are so few paintings, at least at the time. I made these in 2014. Oh, okay. And I wasn't really seeing too much of whale art. So I started this series and I wanted to bring the whales into an environment that was completely foreign to anything that you would ever see a whale in. Mm -hmm. So I created the terrestrial whale series and trying to bring in different themes, bring in the forest, um, farmlands, like in, if I remember right, this was based on just a row of lavender fields and try to embody just a very calm, serene emotion through putting these two subjects together. Well, it's interesting because as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, unless we're on this coast and unless maybe we're on a boat or a ferry, maybe we will see a real whale. If tragically we might see it in an aquarium, mm -hmm. which is really sad whales are in trouble it's interesting you are bringing it to our environment mm -hmm. to our various environments mm -hmm. just talk a bit about that i wanted them to be visible yes. like when we see whales out in the ocean we might see a tail fluke if we're lucky we might see a spy hopping orca for a second but to see the entire creature and to really give the viewer a chance to connect with it mm -hmm. as an entire creature because we'll see animal paintings of various degrees and we'll be able to connect with that animal like we see like the Bateman paintings and we can connect with that animal because we can see that animal but we can't see whales not out in the wild not unless you might have a drone and I just wanted to give people an opportunity to connect and it's interesting because they're free Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. free in your paintings, mm -hmm. not caged. Yes. I was really taken. Well, okay, let's start, start with the albino. There is an albino whale. You have an albino whale. Talk yes. a bit about that. I or you don't know. I can't remember if I knew about Megaloo before or after I started doing the painting. Doesn't really matter. No, but it was actually what started the whale painting series was that albino humpback that I made. Oh, okay. And then it just kept spurring more and more ideas on as I just worked through different species, different environments, and seeing what worked best. Well, they all work. I was quite taken by, to me, the ruin. The first thing I thought when I saw it was Rome. Mm. It could be our ruin. Mm. And talk about that painting. Because I think it's Syrian, isn't it? it? It is Syria, yes. And with that piece, I really wanted to challenge myself. Because, as you can see, most of my work is out in nature. It's mm -hmm. in the forest. It's in landscapes. It's in a very calm, serene environment. But I wanted to do something that pushed me out of my comfort zone. And nothing push me, pushes me out of my comfort zone more than people and architecture. So I decided, all right, I, I first started the painting and I tried giving the perspective using my reference image and it looked awful, absolutely awful. So I went to my friend and said, hey, can I borrow your projector? So I borrowed his projector and I got the line work down and then it just kind of turned into a paint by numbers of getting everything where it needs to be working within a limited palette because most of my works are done with a limited palette of maybe three or four colors at most. Okay. And doing my best to render this scene that was completely destroyed, mm -hmm. like completely unlivable. It's a literal war zone. And then... And why Syria? I looked up images of war zones, and that's what came up oh, at the time. Yeah. Keep going. You were on a thought, but I guess I grabbed it away from you. Of your Gra Grab it by the tail. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so in continuing with the whale series, I wanted to really 
challenge that feeling of calm that I was able to get with the other paintings and see if I could get that with the little the literal war zone. Mm -hmm. So I interjected the image of a sperm whale and this little teeny tiny little girl with a whale you stuffy. Can, you have to really look for that teeny tiny little girl. Yes. Which could be all of us. Absolutely. We all have an inner child. It's interesting because you mentioned uh, people aren't one of your things and I thought a lot about after seeing this stuff. That's why I'm so glad it's around me. I'm getting tears. I don't know why. You do think about people. I do. The a messages, lot. I think, are going out to people. Mm -hmm. Whales are in trouble too. Never mind that Syria or the Ukraine or wherever it's going to be next. Just talk a bit about that. It's all interconnected. We are the ones that are responsible for all of it. And I think it's our duty to do our best to correct those practices so we don't stay in this environment that is just on the brink of collapse. So it's up to us to acknowledge and change our behaviors. So we're able to not only support each other as humans, but support our environment as a whole. And that is the reality is if we stay on the course we are, nature is going to self-correct as it always does and do its best to create a livable world. And that livable world might not be one for us. And that's completely fine. The world is better off without humans. Interesting, because when, you, when I first looked at this painting, of course, certain things, I love forests. I take my dogs to Mount Park. I love forests. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I don't know if that is a dinosaur, but it looks like a dinosaur to me. That's a wolf heel. Isn't that funny? Well, <laughs> dinosaur, <laughs> sort of. But yes. what it made me think of was the fact that, you know, dinosaurs had been here for 80 million years and they disappeared. They're still here. In different In a okay, different form. Ahead. We have birds. They're just a much more evolved form of dinosaurs, but dinosaurs are still here. Turtles. Sharks, I guess, are kind of not dinosaurs, no. but kind of. Sharks were here before trees. Oh, well, there you go. So, you must have studied this then. I love the natural world. I absolutely love the natural world. And I will soak up any bit of biology I can because it just lights my heart on fire. It's a wonderful thing to just. And spurns you to do artwork. It does. Well, you had a showing at uh, the Springwater. Yeah. I did not go, but I heard lots. I know, sorry. <laughs> this, this was many moons ago. This was many moons ago. This is in right? the before times. Yeah. And I'm not even sure if I knew you were an artist, I, you know, like in the sense of your own artist, right? Mm. But, you know, I heard comments from people, and people were pretty uh, excited by your paintings. Mm. Whimsical seemed to be the word. And it's so interesting because I was thinking about that whimsical. Like to me, it's just so serious. Mm. Your whale series is so serious. And even, you know, the forestry. Okay, the tree has a being, but trees do have being. And people mm. are learning more and more in the science world. They protect each other. They help each other. Mm -hmm. They feel. Talk a bit about that. I'm just starting my book, The Hidden Life of Trees, so I can't talk too much about it quite oh, yet. Oh, <laughs> just little hints. Well, just, talk about the painting, though. You know, it's like... <clears throat> I, I, wanted, I wanted to make a painting that you could explore, just like you enjoy Mount Park. I, I love that park. But just as anybody enjoys going through the forest, seeing the moss, seeing little slugs, seeing just little flowers, little, little flowers, flowers, all the little details. I wanted something that somebody could really get lost in, just like they would in discovering different hiking paths. And this was that painting for me where I wanted all the little details I could. And the more you look through it, the more that you see. Yes, this is partly why I wanted it here, because I knew I couldn't possibly have seen 
everything that you've got there. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you think that most people wouldn't notice like right away? The tree is pretty obvious. The tree is obvious. That's what draws people in and mm -hmm. tells people that this is probably a bit more of a surreal piece than it lets on. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing, well, you, you see, you know, the kind of octopus tree, and then you see the bright nudibranch, the blue nudibranch, just to the right of it. Yes. And then you start looking around and you say, oh, wait, what is that? That's, that's not a plant. Well, that's a sea pen that looks very similar to the ferns. And then you keep looking around and then you start seeing things like the starfish or the little black I crabs. Noticed. Oh, I didn't notice the black crabs, but I did notice the starfish. And you Oh, yes, there's a black crab there. Yep. Oh, and cool. and you see all these little creatures like the the wolfiel peeking out from yeah. the right or the nautilus and I think one of the details I managed to really hide the best is the bull kelp. In yes, through the because back. it's kind of waving through it, mm -hmm. but yes, mm -hmm. yes. So this is one of those paintings that I actually have right by my bed. And I love being able to wake up in the morning and look into the forest of my paintings and then look out the window and see the forest around my cabin and yes, just- you're surrounded there nicely, actually. Absolutely, yeah. So I know you've done <clears throat> <clears throat> some of your photography, we'll maybe talk about that, you know, Granville Island, mm -hmm. in layers. So are all your paintings in layers? For the painting practice? Yes. Uh, it all starts with me staring the canvas down, and it's staring at me back, and it just becomes this, you know, match of me looking into the void. And then I will cover the entire canvas. Uh, sometimes I'll start with... Uh, a graphite drawing just on the, on the white on the white on the gesso but typically I will block it off as fast as possible so every part of the canvas is covered so I don't see any more white so it's not empty exactly and that really gets the ball rolling and then it's just a matter of blocking in my subjects coming in with color coming in with highlights and then really getting into the fine details. And this is acrylic? Acrylic, yes. And that seems to be the e not the easiest medium. It's not easy by any means. No I know medium that. Is easy. No we, medium is easy, I know that. But um, accessible maybe is the word because it's not like oil that anyways seems to be Dry, takes longer to dry or to manipulate or talk a bit about that technical part. Uh, it's difficult because I, I do live in a small cabin. So even though acrylic is not as volatile as other mediums like oil, it still does off gas. Oh, so okay. I have to be mindful of, you know, keeping the windows open in my space when I am painting because... Protecting it, yourself. Exactly. You're really not supposed to be painting in the same area you're living, but that's just the reality of living in a small place. Well, and yeah. Okay, so I mentioned the photography. So you've done photography. Yeah. The Gram Granville Island photo was interesting. I don't know if you brought it with you. Uh, Granville Street. It Granville was... Street, that's... that's yeah, it's, but we can d deal with yeah. that later. Um, I think you did that in layers. I did, yes. Talk a bit about what was happening to Granville Street at that time and the ghosts. So several years ago when Granville Street was getting remade, it was closed entirely off to traffic because they were redoing the street. So one of the things I really enjoy doing as far as my interdisciplinary practice goes is I love playing in Photoshop. Photoshop is just such a fun program for me. So I went down Granville Street and I would take, you know, 20 odd steps or so, take a picture. 20 odd steps, take a picture. And just kept going down Granville Street for a few blocks. And then I got the most balanced ones and I stacked them all into Photoshop on different layers and I brought down the opacity, so it ended up being like a film transparency. 
and I then layered all of these and compressed all of these into one single pane. And now you have the ghosts of people walking past and the signs and the compilation of just the colors at the time as well. So everything just kind of became one, but at the same time, it hits an area of your memory where you can really see it and go, I know where that is. I, I mm -hmm. can recognize this space, even though it is completely abstract at this point. Yeah, it was an interesting photograph. I like the, um, well, it was interesting because there wasn't the same traffic there. And mm -hmm. yet, so there are those ghosts. It was uh, mm -hmm. an interesting photograph. There was a project I think you were involved in. Um, photography. I think it was a friend of yours. Maybe you were working, you were all working together. And you were watching a movie. Oh, yes. And um, emotions captured. Talk about that project and what it was. Uh, it was with my cohort at the time, Daniel Hyam. And he was using a large format camera. And with large format cameras, you need to do an extensive amount of preparation and you can only get one image. Okay, so a large format camera, does that mean it is large? It, yes, it okay. is very large. So like physically the, it's large and it's doing it, large. It, it has a presence. <laughs> okay. And it has quite a large field of view too for the film as well. So he had a number of us students for his project watch the movie Dancer in the Dark. What's that movie about? The movie is, if I can recall, because it's been over 10 years now. Well, just, yeah, yeah, more or less. And it's of a young woman who works in a factory, and she's trying to do her best to pursue her dreams while her vision is gradually failing her. Mm -hmm. And it is a very emotionally fraught movie. And the point of Daniel's project was to get to the most emotionally intense part of the movie when you're completely wrecked and you're now invested in this film after watching it for nearly two hours right. and suddenly you see the flash of the large format camera as you're in the dark. And you'd forgotten. You had completely forgotten that this was actually happening. So you're now captured through the medium of photography at your most vulnerable as you got mucus hanging down your neck and you're just like falling you, apart. You're really, you're, you're, you're moist there. in all the wrong ways. So <laughs> it's just, it was a really fascinating project and also one that really opened the door to documented vulnerability because it was a series of photographs of people just totally emotionally wasted and people had consented to being photographed in this state. Like, how did he think of that? And how did people react after the fact? I'm not sure how he... Did you, did you have a group therapy thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we did have a critique session, as we always do in these manners, but we all came together after the fact, and it was a lot of kind of it was a combination of nervous laughter of seeing everybody in this state, but also a very somber mood because we were all witnessing each other's most emotionally raw state. And what did it say about the movie or just, um, well, yeah, what did it say about the movie? Because you know, certain movies touch you in a way that no other one can, right? Mm -hmm. It was well done. Yeah, it was definitely on the long side, for sure. But for something that had that level of emotional punch, it needed that time to really build up to that crescendo. Yes, you can't just put it there and mm -hmm. expect it to be felt. Mm -hmm. What did he do with that afterwards? What did he move on to? 
I haven't been in touch with Daniel for years, so I really don't know. But he was a very, very passionate person for photography. So I hope he's doing well. <laughs> so are there any other projects that you're moving on to? Well, there's a new project. Well, I don't know how new it is, but the painting over there. Is that new or old and ongoing? It is an ongoing. That is a work in progress right now. And it's one of those things that I'm doing to get back into painting because I have been having a hard time getting the brush to the canvas for a few years now. So does the glass work take that away a bit? Yes and no. I find doing the glass work, it's great for continuing to keep me really engaged and in practice and improving with my art. And I'm so thankful for that. Yeah. But I also find that, especially on more conceptual days, I get home and my brain is fried because I've used all of my mental capacity to do the work in the studio. So I come home and I'm just cross-eyed. So That's I, enough. Yes. But at the same time, while I have that staring at me at the canvas at, or at the easel at home, I'm also working on a project with Johnny Aiken where we're working on a children's book together. And, and this is kind of interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't want to talk about it too much, but it's your thing with humans that you don't do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Talk a bit about that. You don't want to give the project away, I understand, but just mm -hmm. talk about the process or what, what that's been like. It has been a very healthy challenge. And I really appreciate Johnny coming to me with this concept of having two children learning how to exist in a world where children are still being taught the social constructs of racism, of exclusion, of bullying, and how do they navigate that with their friendship intact. Mm -hmm. And on the creative side of it, it's teaching me different things about perspective of rendering children in the first place because again working with illustrating humans way out of my comfort zone but it keeps me really engaged and challenged and I appreciate that I like being able to kind of lean against my surge capacity of different work that's out of my scope I think that's pretty you must be pretty confident in yourself and your, your work to, to, no, I mean, to challenge yourself like that. Like for, you know, I mean, my art classes were whatever, but I just did not have, like, it was like, I feel like I am not going back to that class. I'm so untalented. You know what I mean? Like you mm. have this, it must be really inside you. You're very confident. I don't see it as confidence. I don't see it as confidence. That's so interesting. Well, it must be really in you that you would mm. take challenges. I just see it as a means of cultivating compassion because I, I see the areas I need to improve. I, I can look at my piece, do self-critique, go, okay, this isn't working, this is, and just continue to push myself as much as I can. But it seems to work so <laughs> I'll take it well and it seems to me too that you're go ahead well I find it interesting because um, I think it's interesting you are going to be dealing with children and people and the human being mm -hmm. but I see in your work that sitting there mm. I see politics of sorts and I see the caring not only of the creature but the animal but the forest, but mm -hmm. humans, obviously. Absolutely. They're just that little detail that come into every painting as well. Like if you look at this piece, you'll actually see some areas where trees have been cut. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's the hint of human involvement, but I don't want it to be right in your face, typically. Mm -hmm. Thank you, AJ, for doing this. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute honor. Oh, no. And I was so glad you, when you said, oh, yeah, I can bring the paintings. I was so glad I wanted to be surrounded <laughs> by it. 
And thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Joey. This has been great, this spot. <laughs>